Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I got a case today, and it is... Uh, it's a shocking. humdinger. It is a humdinger. So I was trying not to say that, but yep, this is... Um, you know, I was uh, watching TV. I know you're shocked, but it's summer break, so that's what I do. And there was a TV show on, and um, I was shocked. I never heard of this guy, and I immediately, my daughter's like, are you going to do a sh- podcast on that? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so of here course. we go. An episode. You ready? Yep. Yep. Let's go. Imagine you're a probation officer, and you get a phone call that one of your offenders hasn't checked in with you as of late. Now, since he's an elderly man in his late 70s, you really kind of hope he's okay. Seems like the man had a little problem of taking things without paying for them. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he was in Tahoe one day in December 2008, and he went to the grocery store, filled up his cart, and then just simply walked out of the store. Just didn't pay for it. You know, there you go. Right? Get away with Every it. Day. Right. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he did not get away with it, and he was arrested and given a year of probation. It is April 13th, 2010, an officer goes to the home to check on him. Since he had failed to check in, the visit would be a surprise. Mm, was it a surprise? And not, not for him. The officer goes into the home, and he talks to the man. He then walks about the house to get a look at, you know, what's going on in the home, and that's pretty standard. It all looks okay, albeit a bit dirty. And when I say a bit, I mean a lot. It's very crowded with many, many things. Just bit of a, a hoarder? A little, little bit of a hoarder. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Located in the back of the home, the officer discovers a locked room. Now, this room had a giant padlock on it from the outside. So Yeah, lock- no, that's not going to yeah. be good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Locking either something in there or something from getting out. Immediately sensing something is not right, the officer demands to get into the room. And, of course, the offender, the man, refuses to comply, and he becomes quite angry. Hmm, seems like he might be hiding something. (laughs) Not allowing the officer into the room went against his probation, so he was arrested on the spot. A search of his pockets would reveal a single bullet, along with the classified ad, for the sale of a gun. The same kind of gun that would use the bullet that he had in his pocket. Mm -hmm. Now, once again, this violates his probation and the man was taken into custody. The officer calls for backup, more people. He needed more people to come and I guess get into that room and begin a search on the house and property. What authorities would find in the house is what nightmares are made of. And I am not kidding. This is a scene straight out of one of those haunted houses. Kids visit on Halloween night, you know, like things Mm -hmm. hanging. But this was no haunted house, and no one, children or adults, should have to see what's inside. (laughs) It's so creepy. Here we go. And I'm not laughing, because I'm just laughing because people are weird. That's all I'm going to say about that. Upon arriving, the front door of the home had been boarded up, so the officers have to enter through the back of the home. Piles and piles of junk, trash, writings, cards, dishes, dirty dishes, clean dishes, Furniture, old furniture, new furniture. It's everywhere. Yeah, it's it's just a a hoarder. Right. On the couch is a stack of one of those, which cracks me up, those vintage type detective magazines they used to publish, Mm -hmm. you know, where the woman's on on the cover and she's tied up with a bandana in her mouth. And it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, she was a wanton woman, but no one wanted her or something. The ones from the 50s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once officers locate the keys to the back room, they unlock the first door, unsure of what awaits them on the other side. They open the door and wow, seems uh, the little probation violator also had a little thing for guess what, Jen? 
remember it's on the side of the road it's not a body it's a mannequin oh, mannequin mm-hmm. had little things for mannequins well the little thing was actually a big thing there are dozens of mannequin pieces shall i say all over the room mm-hmm. some were missing arms some were missing legs some were missing torsos piles and piles of mannequins all around them there's a box of arms a box of hands a box of feet a box of legs you know you get it but the worst was yet to come Officers head to the locked garage, and the door rises up to unveil yet more mannequins. But these were different than the others. These mannequins had been well taken care of by someone. They all had different wigs, from raven black to auburn to blonde. They all had lingerie on and garter belts, complete with lacy undies or panties, because I know you love that word. Mm -hmm. Each was dressed with care, and each posed standing next to the other. One even had a noose around her neck, allowing her to hang from the garage rafters. Seems like this man's thieving issue was nothing compared to this little hobby. But seems he is, uh, you know, a renaissance man with a few talents, Jen. Namely, photography. He's very into photography. You see where all this is going, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I do. Inside, officers locate photos of women all over the place. I mean, thousands upon thousands of photos of women. The women varied in age from quite young to, shall we say, mature. They were all wearing lingerie of some type or another and were posing for a camera. Him. Obviously, you can tell that they were in there and they were posing for him. Consensually, correct? Yes. Like, you can tell that they were posing, you know, most. But we'll get to that. Most of the women were wearing pantyhose from fishnet stockings to the ones with the seams running up the back. You know, the ones, I guess that would be from like the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the little seam up the back of the hose. One thing that immediately stuck out to the investigators is that while some of these ladies seemed to be smiling and posing for the camera, there were some other photos that featured women tied up and they were either passed out, playing dead, or were dead. We're not talking like a photo or say even 10. We're talking thousands and thousands of photos, some alive, some not, some playing, you know. He had pictures of corpses. They don't know that yet because, you know, they but and they're dressed. They all have lingerie. uh, Well, sort of dressed, scantily clad dress, but some of them were nude or partially nude. Okay, so I think we can all agree that this is creepy stuff, but technically not against the law. It's not illegal. You can't be charged for being creepy. But what he can be charged with is what an officer locates in the house. Seems like this guy liked to document, you know, write down stuff, every single thing he did from day to day on paper, as well as a calendar, such as what he ate that day, what doctor appointment he had, who he talked to on the phone, who he sexually assaulted that afternoon. Lovely. You know, good anything and, yeah, good anything and everything was written down. This Too bad he help. didn't write down that... Um... Officer's appointment with that the day. PO. Yeah. <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you. Now, these lists range from way back in the 1950s to the current day. The page would list the year at the top and then little notes about what we can assume were possible victims or possible people that he posed for photography. Yeah. What year was this? 2010. Now, mind you, he's in his late 70s. So right. think about the time frame. Right. And the list started back in the 50s. You see where I'm going with this. Let's, yeah, he was probably yeah. born in the 40s. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that. The page would list the year at the top and then little notes about what we can only assume are some of his possible victims or people. It, it remains to be seen yet. They don't know. But strangely enough, he did not name them by name, but instead by a place such as Girl I Met in Kansas at Dance Studio. Oh. She was so pretty with great nylons and hair. Had to rape her in my car because it was so cold out. Oh, poor thing. It was cold. Too cold. What a No kidding. Mm. Like, this is the detail he went into. So this is making it easy for the officers, but it's also making it very... It's hard because there's no name. There's no name. And the list, this goes on and on. This guy was... A son of a yeah. bitch. Girl from Buffalo I met on the bus. Girl I picked up hitchhiking on the PCH. He would even put small details alongside the statement, such as, got her drunk and gave it to her good, which he loved that, uh. giving it to them good. He loved that. Or... Gave it to her in the front seat. These writings went on and on and went on for several decades. This investigation just went from a probation violation to a criminal investigation with no idea of where to start or what investigators would discover along the way. 
Now, to say it was overwhelming and daunting would be a major understatement. I mean, if you saw the dude's house and all the stuff, I don't even know where you would begin. So knowing this was going to take more than a few guys that they had on the scene, they decided to seal off the home until they could get more people there. As they were about to wrap it up, they would find yet another list. But this list was different than the others. It was more ambiguous. It featured 10, but at the same time, it was simply a person with the location. When you said and featured 10, it featured 10 women? 10 women. Okay. I'm going to read them to you. So. Okay. It read as the following. Number one, girl near Heldsburg, Mendocino County. Number two, girl near Port Costa. Number three, girl near Loganitas. That was spelled wrong. They determined that later. Four, girl on Mount Tam. Number five, girl from Miami near Down Peninsula. Number six, girl from Berkeley. Number seven, lady from 839 Leavenworth. Number eight, girl from Woodland near Nevada County. Number nine, girl from Linda, and then in parentheses, Yuba County. And then number 10, girl from, and it's M-R-V, and then in parentheses, cemetery. So what, what does this all mean? He was they a don't traveling know. man. What police needed to do was find out why the 76-year-old man named Joseph Naso made this list. While it was different than the rest, and more importantly, what it meant for the 10 that were listed. Authorities create a task force to look into all this that they had recovered at the residence. And believe me, it was quite the undertaking. Five investigators would be given the task of logging and processing all that was taken from his home. And it would take three weeks alone, three weeks to complete that. Well, he's a hoarder. What are you going to do? Joseph Naso was born on January 7th, 1934 in Rochester, New York. He went on to enlist in the U.S. Air Force, and once he was out of the Air Force, he met his first wife, Judith. The marriage would last 18 years, and the couple would have a son. I believe his name was Charlie, um, and he was later diagnosed as schizophrenic. Now, even though they divorced, Joseph and his ex-wife, Judith, would remain friendly till the end, shall I say? <laughs> Joseph would live in San Fran in the 1970s and then on to Central California in the 1980s and the Sacramento area in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when he finally moved to Reno, Nevada in 2004. And I give you all those dates because you can see when they find some of these people, it's they easy. Correlate. Yes, it's easy to see how that all went together. Joseph was no stranger to law enforcement. You see... In 1958, Joseph picked up a hitchhiker from a bus stop and offered to give her a ride home. And he did. It was fine. He dropped her off safely. No problem. The next time he saw her, he once again asked if she'd like a ride. Feeling safe, since she had taken a ride with him before, she agreed. This time it would not end as nicely as the first time she took the ride. In his journal, he wrote, quote, I had to force her down and hold her skirt up, her girdle down. It was hard work. He would be arrested for the woman's rape in 1958. 1961, he did the exact same thing, and the woman, again, reported the rape, but nothing ever happened in the case. It seemed he had been busy for many years doing this, but he never did the time. Many women didn't report the crimes, and he continued to get away with it. Apparently, the police with the victim in 1961 they didn't believe her. They said she was just doing this to um, get her boyfriend jealous. Yeah. And then there was mentions of what were you wearing? Where were you? You know, all the usual victim, things. Victim blaming. Yeah. So he would he would repeatedly rape and attack these women. And either they would just not report it out of embarrassment or whatever reason it was. But if they did, he rarely he would rarely get in trouble for it. Misogyny at its best. <laughs> so at this time, he's back, you know, he's in jail. He's waiting. He's on that probation charge. His wife, his ex-wife, Judith, comes in to see him. Now, without Joseph realizing it, you got to remember, he's quite old in his late 70s at this time. I guess he wasn't quite sure on how things worked in jail. But all visits are recorded and they listen in. They can listen in any time. They can listen to your phone calls. That would be Joseph's first mistake. Joseph tells his ex-wife, Judith, that there are certain things still at the house and he needs to make sure police will never get them, never find it. He asked his wife to have their son, 
break into the home and get his safety deposit keys out of there. Well, thank you, Joseph Nazo. You just made the detective's job a bit easier with a new place to start looking. They recorded all that, so of course they knew. Investigators then venture back to the bank to see what they could find. In one box, they find over $150,000 in cash. Okay. In another box, they find yet more photographs and newspaper articles. But these were not like the others, Jen. These were special. These obviously meant something to him, and he wanted to take care of them. He wanted to keep them. You see, on the front side was the photograph of a woman, and there was various women. She was nude or close to it, and again, she appeared to be unconscious or dead or pretending to be unconscious or asleep even. All of those would work. But when you flipped it over, there was a newspaper article mounted to the other side. The first one they found, the article talked about a woman named Pamela Parsons, who was found murdered in the town of Linda, located in Yuba County. Huh, that sounds could familiar. The, yep. Could this be number nine on the list that was found as girl from Linda, Yuba County? Police are wondering. With a bit of research, investigators learned that Joseph Naso lived in the area at the time Pamela was found. Police also find additional photos of Pamela in the stash of evidence recovered from his home. However, in these photos, she was alive and posing in various pieces of lingerie, often with hoes, as he mm. likes to his do that. fetish. Mm -hmm. It seems that Joseph really, really liked the style of pantyhose with the line up the back. In fact, in many of the pictures, many of the photos police took in, Sometimes if they didn't have the hose with the seam up the back, he would just take like a Sharpie marker and draw the line on the hose. And it was clearly obvious because of the size of the pin mark versus the size of the photos. You know. Right. So he so liked pinup girls type. That's what rocked his boat. Mm -hmm. So it was September 15th, 1993, when a man called police to report that his girlfriend Pamela Parsons was missing. It would be just three days later that the body of Pamela would be discovered in an orchard in Yuba County. Pamela had ligature marks around her throat, and she was nude. To try to track Pamela's movement, the police go back to look at the calendars that Joseph had kept so meticulously to see if perhaps she's mentioned, because he liked to mention little things like that. Now, since Pamela disappeared on the 15th, they started there. They didn't have to go far, Jen, because lo and behold, right there on the calendar, the little block that had the number 15 on it, mm -hmm. Joseph, Joseph had written, got even with an old score. Oh. Mm -hmm. So thinking w what that could be, I'm not really sure. They go back, you know, a couple days in the calendar and find an entry that Joseph made about a photo shoot with a pretty lady hitchhiker who had nice legs. He added, at the end, she stole from me. Please believe this is the motive for killing Pamela. Investigators are certain that they have just put a name to number nine on the list, but that also means that this kill list has nine other people on it, nine other women. This case just changed directions from serial rapist to potential serial killer. Like I said, I got the story from the TV show and then, mm -hmm. you know, went down a couple rabbit holes, but I was just shocked that I, you know, I've heard about most everything because I'm a loser. But just like there's so much to this. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a lot to it. I'm just going to say that. But, you know, I mean, with the writings and then the, the kill list of 10. Right. He was quite the bookkeeper. I mean, he mm -hmm. documented everything, which probably doesn't bode well for him in court. So now police have pretty much they're pretty sure that this is Pamela Parsons. And because she was located, you know, she was a quote unquote special one in that safety deposit box. They think that they want to go back to that box and see what else they can find in there, the other articles, and kind of, you know, see if it leads to anything. One of the things that they examine is a newspaper article that they got from that box. The Appeal Democrat newspaper article from 1994 described a body that was dumped right outside of Marysville, near the town cemetery. The woman was identified as 31-year-old Tracy Tafoya. No cause of death could be determined by the coroner, so the case remained open and unsolved. Looking at the list, this could be number 10. Girl from MRSV with the cemetery behind it. Mm -hmm. So Marysville would be that. He just, you know, put the initials. Police need in to a find, hurry. Yeah. yeah, police need to find out for sure. They reach out to relatives to see what they can find. 
they find out that Tracy got married young and started a family right away, having two boys and two girls back to back. All seemed okay until one day Tracy's husband, he'd had it. He packed up the kids and took off, never to be seen again, or the kids, which would have a problem with that, but okay. So Tracy then met another man and was soon married once again, and they would have a baby boy. But at just one month old, that baby would die from SIDS. Mm. Tracy couldn't take the stress of it all, obviously, and soon fell apart. Her husband left her, and she found herself doing sex work to get by. On August 14th, 1994, a female body had been discovered near the Marysville Cemetery. She had been tossed down an embankment. Due to the time of the year, August, her body had decomposed rapidly, so, so much so that they, um, they couldn't even tell if it was a female or a male. It was pretty much just, you know, it was pretty bad. Bones. But the one thing that they did know is that Tracy had blown off one of her fingers to a portion of her finger when she was a kid playing with fireworks. And this helped identify her body. Once again, they go into Joseph's calendars to see if that would, if he would tell on himself, basically. Sure enough, on August 6th, the day Tracy would disappear, written in the calendar block was, met Tracy, put it to her. (sighs) Tracy Tafoya would be number 10, girl from MRVS Cemetery. It's cold and callous, isn't he? But it, and he doesn't even name them. And you know he knows the names. That's what just annoys me. Now, while this seems to be a no-brainer that he, you know, that he did this, because, again, they're tying him to it, it's not enough. DNA was not yet a thing, so they needed more. That would come in the form of time, Jen. Joseph Neza was sentenced to one year for violating his probation. Now, this means that detectives had one year to build a good, solid case against him for, this, for all these acts, but then also try to locate who these victims are. It's a one year. That's quite the, quite the task. While Joseph is in jail, detectives go to interview him at the Washoe County Jail. Now, what they're hoping for is, a, of course, a full confession. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Or at the very least, let something slip that would tie him to the murdered women, Tracy and Pamela. The detectives go at him by complimenting him to stroke his whole ego. They, You're such a great photographer, you know, because they, they have his number, if you know what I'm saying. They tell him what a great photographer he is. And, you know, that's you just did so well taking those pictures and you're very talented. And he's like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm." (laughs) They start showing him certain pictures that he had taken of women and they're wanting him to basically say, yeah, that's so and so. And I met her, you know, they're trying to nail him in this. One such picture would be Pamela Parsons. He tells detectives, oh, yeah, she's pretending to be dead. She's just pretending. He remembered even saying to the detectives, you know, countering back to what he did that, oh, yeah, I do remember her. She was a hitchhiker with good legs. Now, that's just exactly (laughs) what he wrote in his calendar. So they knew he knew her. They knew he did it. But again, that's not, you know, that's not enough. And maybe she was posing to be asleep or dead. Maybe she wasn't dead. I mean, it's doubtful that she was alive. But sure, let's we can pretend. So investigators think they have him in a pretty good spot. And, you know, he is stuck in jail right there. So they really start laying it to him and trying to get him to admit he knows Pamela and Tracy and, and that he had something to do with the disappearance and or murder of them. Now, they're, they're really, you know, getting in there. Well, he then he sees it coming. He shuts it down, shuts the interview down. I'm done. I want to go back to my cell. I'm done. After he shuts the interview down, detectives decide they need to go back and get into some of those safety deposit boxes he had. And bam, they get something. Located in one of the boxes was a woman's handbag. It's really like a clutch, if you want to be specific. (laughs) I mean, that's what I thought with the picture of it. But okay. In it were ID cards and business cards. Okay, this is awesome. They're going to get a pretty good lead. They're going to have an idea about this. The ID card had a photo of a woman, and her name was Sarah Dillon along with a newspaper article about Bob Dylan, yeah, the Bob Dylan, and his wife, Sarah Dylan. So at this point, the police are kind of freaking out. They're like, did he attack Bob Dylan, the famous Bob Dylan's wife, or worse yet, killer? They had no idea, which I wouldn't know either. They contact the LA County PD, and they find out that this is, in fact, a different Sarah Dillon. That Sarah Dillon's the wife of Bob Dylan is alive and well. She's totally fine. She is not dead. She's living her best life. Mm-hmm. 
So then detectives contact Bob Dylan's, you know, management people, his publicists, you know, the people, you, my people call your people, those people. And they find out that the woman was actually a huge fan of Bob Dylan. And in fact, she was a groupie, if you will. Mm -hmm. She followed him around the world watching his concerts and she loved him so much. She had changed her name from Renee Shapiro to Sarah Dylan. Her real name was not Sarah Dylan. That wow. That was not her born name. Yes. Wow. And she she did... changed her name to his wife's name? Mm-hmm. Yep. Because wow. she loved him okay. so much. And, and she did look a lot. They, they both had dark hair. They very, they did look similar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, so it, hmm. it's, that's a true fan right there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to change my name to Mrs. Brad Pitt. I mean, you could. <laughs> Just kidding. Get a tattoo. <laughs> I don't, no. I don't know. I don't. Okay. No. It's just a fan. Different day, Jen. Yeah. Different day. No. What just, say. Yeah. It's not hurting anybody, I guess, right? It's, that's so. right. So okay. investigators, they, they need to track down, reach out to Sarah's family, and they learned that Sarah had disappeared sometime in 1992, and no one had heard from her since. In the safety box, there's a business card with the date of May 2nd, 1992. Warfield Theater. And that is written by hand on the back of just a regular business card. So obviously somebody had written that. Maybe it was Sarah. Maybe it was somewhere else, somebody else. So detectives take a look and they realize that, yes, there is a theater and it's located in San Francisco. And it just so happened to be one of the dates that Bob Dylan was holding a concert that day. The handwriting seemed, mm, oh, so familiar, Jen, since, you know, these detectives had been looking at it nonstop on the calendars and the massive amounts of writings. And they, that, that handwriting pretty much looks like Joseph Naso's. Now, the leads, unfortunately, for now, dry up here. They're unable to find out anything else about Sarah Dillon. Now, granted, she's an adult. She could have just disappeared. She could, you know, be living elsewhere. And without much else to go on, they just kind of have to put that on the back burner. They've kind of run through their things. They've run through the safety deposits. They're kind of at a, at a standstill. So they decide, I guess we might as well. By things, do you mean clues or? Yeah, just anything. Okay. Like the safety deposit box they've been through, that the writings aren't, they need some more. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they decide to go back and take a look at the list and start from number one. Number one. And that was the girl from Heldsberger, Mendocino County. They contact the police there, and there's no one missing from that area. Nobody was reported missing, shall I say, from that area during that time, during the time frame that this could have happened. Okay. Detectives decide to look into number two, and that would be girl from Port Costa. Detectives contact the Costa County Sheriff's Department, and they learn about a missing girl from 1978. Now, mind you, this is the same area from um, Joseph D'Angelo, better known as the Golden State Killer, the original one, the Night Stalker, the Ears person, mm -hmm. same area. Seems a highway patrolman was driving on the road and he smelled that familiar smell that is decomposition. He pulls over and he takes a look around and he discovers a woman's body. It would turn out to be 21-year-old Carmen Cologne, who had been working as a sex worker and left two babies behind. Joseph Naso was living in Oakland at the time of the disappearance. These are not very far apart at all, map-wise. The medical examiner had the fortitude, smart, to cut off her fingernails and preserve them. DNA was now extracted and entered into the CODA system. Bam, they get a hit. The DNA under Carmen's nails matches the DNA belonging to a man named Joseph Naso. Mm -hmm. The only thing was, this was, uh, you know, a little bit early on still. The only thing was it was a partial match, meaning it could belong to Joseph or it could belong to one of his close male relatives. But we all know that's not the case. No. But, but again, you know, this would not be enough to charge Joseph Nasa with the murder of Carmen Colon. I mean, I don't How much more do they need? <laughs> well, we all know we did it. For a solid I, case. I, that's exactly right. And what year was this as of right now? 1978, she went missing. Right. And then the so, DNA. Well, this was when he got arrested. So 2011. Okay. So ish. DNA. It was around, but it was this right. from. No, I'm but sure. I'm saying that you would think yes. 
back yeah, in the in 1970- 90s yeah. and people really didn't trust DNA evidence as much as no, they do not now. At all. So. Plus, they did that. I'm sure that they did that for different reasons. In 1978, you're not thinking DNA. They were probably right. thinking that maybe a blood sample or something. A hair, something would be found, a fiber, I don't know, something would be found on those. Could have accidentally saved it on accident. Got to get rid of it. Who knows? Either way, it's good that it's still, it was still there. It is, but it doesn't do us any good yet because that's still not enough. But that's okay because we're moving on to number three. Now, this is girl from Loganitas, but actually he misspelled that. It's Loganitas, L-A-G-U-N, Loganitas. But thanks for that. I, well, this could be Thank you for that. It, well, I'm saying it could have. This could have been wrong. You know oh, what I mean? I, I if know, you're looking for a different time, so it just made me giggle the way you said that. Well, because I'm also trying to point out he's a ding dong, just like me. Can't talk or spell. Hey everyone, Cam and I are so excited to announce that we're going to be at the Dark History and Horror Convention in Champaign, Illinois on August 19th and 20th this year, 2022. The folks behind the Dark History and Horror Convention have brought together a great collection of authors, artists, and many others who are familiar with the darker parts of history that most of us were never taught in history class. From Native American massacres to civil rights struggles, from gangsters to John Wayne Gacy, this convention is the perfect place to share your passion with others who are interested in the dark side of history and pop culture. Attending with us is our friend podcaster Bob Mata from Defense Diaries. And along with him is EJ Hammond. Not only did she write a few episodes for us, but she is an expert on Ted Bundy. You can also meet Jason London, better known as Randall Pink Floyd from Dazed and Confused, and his brother Jeremy London, who I'm sure you know from Mall Rats and Gods in General. And from Terminator, John Connor himself. Edward Furlong, who was amazing in American History X. There's so many more guests and vendors that we can't even mention them all here. So hurry up and get your tickets and make sure to follow Dark History and Horror Convention on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We know you're not going to want to miss this event. So hurry now and get your tickets and we'll see you in Champaign, Illinois on August 19th and 20th at the Dark History and Horror Convention. Investigators reach out to police and determine that there is no one missing or murdered during this time frame. But, you know, this is a really, really small area. And just, they just had that hunch. You know what? Let's call around to some of the neighboring communities. Maybe this person wasn't from this area or not quite. And, yep, guess what? They get a hit. It was 1977, and a woman by the name of Roxine Rogash just 18 years old, was killed and found outside of Fairfax, California. This would be just under 10 miles from Lagunitas. Roxanne was a bit of a wild child and may or may not have been working as a sex worker. Something that I just read up today was that uh, a lot of these were said to be sex workers, but yet family would say they were not. So that's it. It's a little muddy, if you will. It's not quite sure. Roxanne was wearing pantyhose when her body was found, but the pantyhose were inside out as if she had been redressed. Now, Roxanne also had pantyhose wrapped around her neck and another pair shoved into the mouth as if to be used for a gag. Oh, police are hoping, police are hoping that hose, they can find it and um, it's going to be, it's going to be good. So they go and they test. DNA. Yep. They're hoping, right? So they go and they test that DNA. But unfortunately, it comes 
back and it the DNA there was some DNA found but it did not belong to Joseph Naso. Instead, Jen, it belonged to his wife Judy, <gasps> Judy Naso. The mm-hmm. pantyhose she she wore those pantyhose. His wife wore those pantyhose and I guess had not been washed. They also were able to locate some semen. So the semen did belong to Joseph Nazo and the pantyhose were Judith's Nazos. Judith Nazos. So he took her pantyhose and used it to kill Roxanne. Mm. Well, cheaper than going by in his own little. No, that's a terrible thing because you know he loves pantyhose. Oh, he Ugh. does. It's a little fetish there, right there. Okay, so here we go. Up next, we got number four, Girl on Mount Tam. A young woman by the name of Pamela Jean Lampson, age 19, told her family and friends that she met a photographer on the Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. We've been there together, remember? We have. And the man man came up to her and said he wanted to do a photo session with her because she was so beautiful. They agreed to meet on Mount Tam. She was never seen alive again, and her body would be discovered just a few days later. There was no evidence to tie Joseph Naso to this victim, but all the puzzle pieces fit because we're getting, we're kind of getting to know his, his, you know, M-O. his mode. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm curious about what brought on his fascination with pantyhose. Oh, no, I couldn't find that. Probably, I don't know. So at this point, this is all, these are the only victims that they could really find and have a possible tie to Joseph Naso. But they're still wondering, you know, is this enough? It's all, I don't want to say circumstantial, but some of it is. And, and you know what I'm saying. So here we go. On April 11th, 2011, Joseph is about to be released from county jail after serving his one year sentence. Do police have enough? Oh, yeah, they do. Waiting outside? He, he's getting released. He's coming through the doors. He's like, whew, I did my year. I'm out. But detectives are waiting on the other side to inform him they were arresting him and charging him with four counts of murder. He was a little surprised, to say the least. Joseph Naso would be interrogated inside the Marin County Sheriff's Office. Investigators show him the list of 10. At first, he plays dumb, and then he changes it to those who, uh, you know, those are my old girlfriends. But uh, I, I don't really want to talk about it. I don't want to get into it. And the old girlfriends, I knew them. They knew me. I don't want to get into it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then the detectives lay out the photos that they got from inside his safety deposit box. They're all lined up in front of him. He wouldn't budge on them, would give them no information on the photos. He's not giving anything up at this point. Mm -hmm. Too bad we're going forward. Joseph Naso would stand trial in June 2013 on four counts of murder in the cases of Pamela Parsons, Tracy Tafoya, Carmen Cologne, and Roxanne Rogash. Now, think about those names for a minute, Jen. We're going to come back to that. Pamela Parsons, Tracy Tafoya, Carmen Cologne, and Roxanne Rogash. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Just, just think about that. Think about what they might have in common. We'll, come, we'll circle the wagons back to that one. In one of the, well, there were several, but in one of the WTF moments during the trial, Joseph Naso decides, you know what? I took a business class. It's going to sound a little familiar. I took a business class back in college. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to represent myself as a lawyer because. Um, SMRT. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think he said, which pretty much left the detectives with their mouth on the ground. You know, I know more about this case than you guys. Uh-huh. <laughs> really? Yeah. Hmm. So he would say in his opening statement, quote, this case is about me, my life. I am not the monster that killed these women. I don't do that. I date. I dance, but I don't kill people. <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. It's great. Uh, it doesn't go very well, as you can really? imagine. Mm-hmm. That's shocking. Mm-hmm. Most people that question- represent themselves for murder really just knock right. the judge. Mm-hmm. Yep. So one of, the, one of the guys in charge of all this was a man named Sergeant Brown. And when he's put on the stand, and you cannot make this up, Joseph Naso like, looks at him and he says, you know, I want to know why you detectives keep referring to this as a rape journal. And Sergeant Brown's pretty much like, because that's what you call it over (laughs) and over again when you violated these women and these girls. I raped them. I had to hold her down. I gave it to her real good. Naso then went on to say, oh, rape. Well, rape does not mean rape to me. It it means Um, more like having sex, right? So 
It's uh, you know, he just used that word to mean having sex, which I mean, rape is having sex non consensually, so it's called rape. Hence the word rape, uh, Joseph. That wasn't the cutting plan he thought it was. I don't believe he's an idiot. There's all kinds of quotes. I'm telling you. As the trial is taking place and the media is covering it, there's a little bit of news and it's making its way all around the state. A phone call comes in from a retired detective who said he had interviewed Naso way back in 1981 in regards to a homicide in Timuron Bay. The body had been put into a plastic bag and had been strangled to death. The victim was Sharia Patton, and she lived at, you ready? 839 Leavenworth. This is hmm. sounds this familiar. Is the, the only one that was called Lady. All, all the victims on the list of 10 were called girls. She was called a lady. Authorities reach out to the building manager because they need, at this time when they found this body, right? And they, they knew that she had lived at 839 Leavenworth. The detectives reach out to the building manager to try to get some more information about Sharia. You want to guess what that building manager's name was? Wouldn't have a clue. Joseph Naso. Yes, he was the ah. building manager there. <laughs> he said he states that she was a nice lady, everything was fine, didn't know much about her, and that was ah. it. The case would go cold for over 30 years. 30 years. In wow. an effort to help identify some more of the victims, police arrive at Sharia's daughter's home with photos in tow. They want to they want to see if maybe Maybe that was her mother's friends or if they went there together, anything like that. As she's looking at some of the pictures, one jumps out of her. It's a young girl with long red hair and bright red lipstick. She's young, probably 16 maybe. And it seems that she, well, it looks as if she's nude underneath a fur coat. The fur coat she has draped like on her shoulders, kind of like come, starting to come off. You know the look. So the daughter is shocked. That coat looks familiar to the daughter because you know what it was her mother's her and That's her mother gross. had bought matching coats a long time ago that was her mother's coat but that was not her mother so police believe that when he killed sharia the tenant in the leavenworth building he cleared out all of her things but he just kept a few things he wanted for himself such as the fur coat among other items who knows because he, the police again found how many things in that house Sharia Patton was number seven, lady from 839 Leavenworth. They believe she has now been identified. So why was she called lady and everybody else were called girls? She was older. She was older. She was, God, she was probably like uh, 40s and 50s, 50s. I believe she was in her 50s. Everybody else is young. Young, like in their 20s, mm -hmm. teens. Mm -hmm. Okay. As the trial is just starting, in fact, I think it might have been day one, there is a startling discovery. Sarah Dillon's skull was located, and with the help of her biological mother's DNA, police in 1998 were able to match her DNA to the skull found in Nevada County. Sarah was last seen alive at a Bob Dylan concert in Hawaii in 1992. Sarah was number eight girl from Woodland near Nevada County. In August 2013, Joseph Nasa was convicted of the four counts, four counts of first degree murder and received the death penalty. The 88 year old is serving his time at San Quentin State Prison today. But since he's already 88, Jen, chances are he will not ever be put to death. Instead, he will die a much more humane death of natural causes than his victims. What a bastard. Now, something that I to mention here a little bit uh it's important to mention that the victims had something in common and that commonality was something that another killer shared with joseph naso now remember i said did you think anything about those victims names and yes anything? the the beginning of the first name was also or the letter beginning of the first name was also the letter correct the end of the second name that's the double name. initial of the victim's names. Mm -hmm. Now, Joseph Nazo, as you remember, was a New York native who, who was born in Rochester, New York. Now, in the 1970s, there was a serial killer, and he was dubbed the ABC killer mm -hmm. because he killed his victims with the same initial of their names, just like Roxanne Rogash and Pamela Parsons and Tracy Tafoya and Carmen Cologne. In fact, one of the women killed in Rochester had the exact same name, Carmen Cologne. She was also a victim in California, as well as New York. Different person, same name. 
So they believe that he may be the ABC killer. However, Joseph Neza was cleared because DNA found on a body from New York did not match DNA found on a victim in California. All right. And you said you just didn't know, believe it. Why not? I just don't, because I just think that's weird. I know I'm not a detective, but I do think it's weird that four of the women he killed had the same, not all of them, because, you know, Sarah Dillon didn't. But it, I just think that's a little, it's just very odd. But Too much of a coincidence? Was, a little bit, don't you think? But was he ever, could they trace it that he was in New York? No, at the no, time? He did, yeah, he was from New York. Yeah, he was living there. But mm-hmm. at yep. the time of the killings. The murders, mm-hmm. the same yeah, murders. I believe so. Yeah, but he he, well, he was cleared, so I got to be fair and say that, but I do just think it's weird. Okay. And I do think it's weird that Carmen Cologne, I mean, that to me, is that name very common? And not to me, maybe it is, but to have that victim be in California and then also have that same name be a victim in New York, just a little weird. And it, as weird as he was, that would be something that would he would get off on, let's be honest, to be able well, to Well, when do did that. he move out to California? I don't know. I set up above, remember? Jen, you're asking me d- dates and stuff. I don't know. That's well, why I said, remember, you, I you've got are, it written out. Yeah. I, yeah, but then I got to go back up there. Uh, San Francisco in the 70s, Senator California in the 80s, Sacramento area in the late 1990s, early 2000s, moving to Reno, Nevada in 2000. Okay. And the alphabet killers were when? And uh, it was it, the time frame worked. That's why they thought he did it because gotcha. he, he lived up there. He lived there. It was in the 70s and he lived in the uh, he lived in Rochester in the 70s. So anyway, that is the case of Joseph Naso. Now, some of these, this is all, you know, they only charged him with four, even though they really could, I I believe, could have. Well, they have linked him to more. Let's put it that way. But they were confident in those four. Right. And he's sitting in in, uh, jail at 88. So there you go. But uh, there's a lot to it. And there's a lot more to this. If you just the statements he makes and stuff, he's, yeah, something else is what he is. Well, the alphabet murders were they they were more child murders too, weren't they? I don't think so. I think it was sex workers. Mm-hmm. Still, Let's see alphabet murders, double initial murders. Let me look it up. I looked it up. Unsolved children's murders, which occurred between seventy one and seventy three. This is per wiki. Okay. Well, there you go. All I know is I'm, so, I got I got the news that's fit to report. I know. I was just checking because I wasn't fit to report. I knew you of know. the alphabet murders, but I was not sure of. The entire um, case. It's not. Ooh, and look at the bottom. Also, related articles, Joseph Nasso. There you go. Thanks, mm-hmm. Wiki. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty known. Other names under Joseph? You want to guess? Crazy Joe. <laughs> yeah. He had nicknames. I didn't put them in there, but it, yeah. like people would refer to him as that because as of his crazy Joe. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. I mean, that's, yeah. The mannequins alone was frightening. I'm telling you, I, I will use a picture uh, and put it on here because it's, uh, and they do believe, that they believe that each of those mannequins, because there's 10 of them. Represented. Each, yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Each, and different. those were the ones that were taken care of. They weren't the ones uh-huh, that were piled he, into the room. Yeah. And then not to gross out, and I was going to leave all this alone, but since we're here, they really do believe he pleasured himself. He, you know, used mm-hmm. those mannequins to relive the moments on the TV show. What is his name? Park Dietz. Park Dietz had uh, been consulted and he, he basically said, you know, he made that list because he liked to write it down, but then to relive it and read right. it. And as he's, you know, what show was fa- this? Uh, it was on ID discovery. I think it's, it's called the murder list because they, they called it the murder list and then the rape, the rape diary or something. They, ne- ne- I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. So it was good. I think it was like an hour and a half long. And it has way more details than this. And it names all the names. And they talk to family members. <clears throat> but, you know, I didn't talk to family members. So I'm obviously. Oh, no, it's always so here. heartbreaking when they do talk to the family members. Well, and, and these, a lot of the, this was so young. And, you know, you forget that, like, people, we grew up with the stranger danger. Don't talk to people. 60s and 70s, single girls would get in a car all the time with the strangers. All yeah. the time. Mm-hmm. It was totally acceptable. I, I don't need a ride to work. I'll just catch one. And mm-hmm. then people would do it all the time. So that is the story of that. I uh, Yeah, I'd which, never heard of him either, but I'm not as uh, well-versed as you are. Uh, you can say obsessed. That's okay. <laughs> also, Jen, let me mention, mm-hmm. Jen, we've been doing this podcast for four years. I over know. four years, Jen. And guess what? 
finally have a family member that listens to it. My cousin Ron uh-huh. from Illinois. Look at you. Thanks, Ron. Since none of your family Thanks, really Ron. does. And it's none I of mine. I do have a do. niece, maybe two that listen. Mm-hmm. I don't know how regularly. So Nikki so, and Becca for Start a podcast. Watching. Your family will love it. My family's never listened to it. They don't even know how to get and I've showed them a million times how to get to it, how you press the play button, all n- nothing. Nothing. <laughs> So thank you, Cousin Rod, for showing the love. I appreciate that. This is what I get. Jenny, how's that little radio show you're doing? It's, it's good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for Happy asking. Me. Yeah. Whew. We're, we're going to be like that one day, too, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I hope not, but maybe. And then, Jen, you had a little message you I wanted do. to send I do. Uh, I was just thinking the other day, and somebody had asked, so I would just like to put it out there if you would like to support cam and i's little radio show here (laughs) you could do it by a bunch of ways one you could do patreon which we do have it for three dollars a month you get early ad free episodes um every once in a while we will put together a separate show or little episode for you Um, we have one in the wings waiting to be edited but right now it's just mostly um ad free and early Two, we have merch on Etsy. If you go to Etsy and type in Our True Crime Podcast, we have t-shirts and the such there that you can order. We also, if you go to OurTrueCrimePodcast.com, we have like a little donate button that you can do a one-time donation, which is fabulous. But you know what? We understand that not everybody has money or Times are funds. Hard, it's, man, the grocery store. I went to the grocery store the other day and I'm telling you, it's See, this, this- Horrible. This is how we are. This is how we are old, right? Yeah. Your little radio show could, uh, yeah, We're yeah. I mean, uh, we know times are tough. Believe me. So, but here's a couple free things that you can help support us, and they would mean the world to us if you did. I mean, you can do all of them if you want, but here's free that, and Cam and I love free. Believe me, this is what I would suggest. One. You could tell your friends and family about us and <laughs> grab their phone and subscribe to us for them. Tell them about us. You know, mm-hmm. spread the news about us. Our and family doesn't <laughs> listen to us, but maybe yours will. <laughs> but yours might. But two, and I know these kind these are kind of a pain in the butt. And I know our feed drops that we do. That's when we do this. Hey, it's Cam and Jen, and we're here to tell you about the new drop from Wondery or the new drop from Sony um, or the you know the new podcasts. That come out and we kind of give you, if you download those and listen to them, that really helps us. Those are kind of like ads. And honestly, they pay better than the actual ads that we do do. So if you, the more those get downloaded, the better chance we have of staying on air. So. It's true. Yeah. So, well. Helps us pay our editor. Exactly. So, and anything else that comes up. But. Like I said, those are two totally free things to do. Just download those or just listen to them because the more downloads we get on those, the better it is. True. But yeah, so there was one that we just put out for Sony this week called Chameleon Scam Likely. Just go right back, play. It's not even 10 minutes long. Just play it. And there you go. You've helped us immensely. Um, Thank you. But yeah, and thank you. And we appreciate your support through the years. It's, you've been amazing. You really have. It's a, warms my heart every time I get, you know, it's just like the first note we got four years ago saying that they liked us. It's Mm -hmm. the same thing. I'm like, oh, it's all happy. Yeah. yeah. But of that, we also, if you want to see us in person, we will be in Champaign, Illinois on the 19th and 20th at the Dark History and Horror Convention, which we're really looking forward to. And then the following week, I believe on the 26th, 27th, and 28th, we will be in Dallas, Texas at the True Crime Podcast Festival. We'd love to meet you. We'd love for you to stop by and come see us. Yes. True that. Mm-hmm. True dad, I mean. Dad we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Yes. Um, all right. Do we want to add anything else? I wanna... think that's about it. I think that's all I have. What about you? Do you have anything else? I don't really. I got another case that this one really is a humdinger. It, I don't. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, there's no words for the sucker. So oh, I think good. I might try, try to dive in later today and write that. Good for you. It's a. Uh, it's, uh, let me just say, 
I'll just give you a little teaser. Okay. I, I could not ever, I, I mean, I think none of us could ever, nor do I hope none of us ever have to experience the abduction and murder of our no. own child. No. But what no. about when they take both of your kids? No, no. That is my biggest fear. And I know I cover a lot of cases dealing with children. And I think that's kind of like the way it's my therapy, maybe. I don't know. But it truly is. I will take anything happening to me over anything mm -hmm. with my kids. I can't. Mm -hmm. The thought of it paralyzes me. It's, and then, I don't, there's no words. Anyway, there you go. So, um, I'm looking forward I guess to it, I guess. That's really all I got, Jen. Yeah, that's all um, I have. Start start school here in 17 days, 16 days, actually, but who's counting? counting. Mm -hmm. I'm counting, Jen. I'm <laughs> counting. But thank goodness I go to work, I go back to school. And two days later, you and I, I got to take a day off to go to the Champaign, Illinois. So there you go. All right. Well, uh, I'm telling you, my kid, especially the youngest, she's going to have a nice little wake up call when it comes time for school because she is staying up till four o'clock in the morning. I was going to say, turn literally a wake up call at yes. 7 a.m. when she has to get up and go to school. She had two friends stay the night last night. They were up like it started at around 11. They got out her electric guitar to play, and she doesn't understand oh. how loud it is. Midnight Even rock though they're concert. downstairs. So right. they had the guitar going. They had the keyboard going. And then when I finally talked them out of, you know, if you can't play the guitar without the amp, then you got to put it away. So then they turned on karaoke. <laughs> started to do karaoke. Gosh, I'm not sure which one's worse. Yeah, yeah. It was... It was something. So I finally fell asleep at four o'clock this morning and they are too. So I should go down there with some pots and pans. I Maybe I'll take up I the do. electric guitar right I would. now. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> are you ready to rock? <laughs> <laughs> Get up. Right. Yeah, I totally would. Damn All right, kids. Jen, I guess until we see you next week. Yep. We'll be here. Remember, same time. Remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Bye-bye. Uh, Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Bertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Bertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. And it seems that she, well, it looks as if she's nude underneath a fur coat. The fur coat she has draped like on her shoulders, kind of like come, starting to come off. You know the look. The daughter <laughs> is shocked and says, sorry. What are you laughing about? What? You? Oh, you know the look. Like You you know what I'm talking about. Like the look where you take it off. You know what I'm saying? I was trying to figure sorry. out how to say that because it's not on your shoulder. Like it's not on your shoulders. It's off your shoulders, but it's not down to your elbows either. I was trying to figure out how to say that. But anyway. Just off your shoulders would have worked. But it just cracked me I up. Like I know the look. Oh, yes. I, I practice that look all the time. <laughs> Jen. It's, okay. Sorry, anyway, Nico. Back to the story.